Hey everyone, uh, how are you guys doing today? We're really excited to be here to talk about our Cellbot Task Force expansion and celebrate one year since we released this really big update for Toontown Rewritten. Uh, I'm joined today by a whole host of developers who worked on this update, and we want to answer your questions about everything that went into it, everything that, uh, you know, all the cool things that happened throughout development, all the struggles that we ran into throughout development. We're here to tell all today. Uh, so just to kick things off, uh, in case you don't know me, I am Joey Zilkowski. I am the creative director of Toontown Rewritten and the project director of this expansion. Uh, I was really involved with just kind of overseeing uh, a lot of the uh, game design aspects of creating this and uh, making sure that it was going to be the the most fun content that it could be for all of you. And I will pass it on to Gabe. Hello. Um, thank you, Joey. Um, I'm Gabe. Um, I joined not too long ago, about a year ago, and I do 3D modeling and animation for the team with the rest of these lovely people here. Um, one of them being Jofo, who I will pass it on to right now. Thank you, Gabe. I'm Jofo. I'm an audio lead and composer for Toontown Rewritten. I came on board in the middle of the pandemic in 2020. And I had the pleasure of working on the, um, the camera room music, the stomper room, uh, and some revisions on the ice game music. And I'm excited to uh, talk a little bit about that with you today. I'm going to pass this on now to my friend, Rush. Hi, everyone. I'm Rush. I'm programming lead for Toontown Rewritten. I am still fairly new to the team. I only joined about like a year and two thirds ago. Uh, I helped out with the ice game. I helped out a little bit with implementing some of the boiler stuff. And I am responsible for the benches in the uh, <laughs> this last update. And with that, I'll pass it on to Maya. Hi, I'm Maya. I'm one of the art leads on the team and a texture artist. And for the update, I did the art direction along with another person and uh, some of the textures. I am a bit sick today, so I'm sorry if my voice won't be extremely clear. And I saw a couple of people asking in the chat um, since uh, you know, not everyone has video on here who each person was that was speaking. So just to let you guys know, I believe Gabe is over to uh, in this direction, I guess my right, your uh, left. The top right on the screen. I'm also Kelblock on the stream. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think let me make sure. So Joe is directly underneath me over here. Maya is to the other side, and then Rush is way over on the opposite side of the corner. So just so you all know who is who. Yeah, um, I think it's actually flipped. Uh, it might be flipped. Yeah, I think it's flipped for you. Put <laughs> uh, the accordion, so... and you'll know who the music person is. Yeah. <laughs> so just to uh, start things off here, I do want to let everyone know we're talking pretty exclusively about Cellbot Task Force today. We just celebrated a year since this expansion came out, and we know you guys have tons and tons of questions about all things Toontown, and we will definitely get to those uh, at some future date. But today we want to focus mainly on Cellbot Task Force, because uh, there's a lot that went into the development of this expansion that we could fill, honestly, hours and hours worth of stream content for. But we're going to try and keep this as short as possible while still covering all sorts of behind the scenes details and showing you some never before seen images um, from the uh, backstage development. But I will answer, I know a big question on everyone's mind right out of the gate besides Cellbot Task Force is what comes next? Uh, we're not going to be sharing today what we're working on next, but I can tell you guys confidently that we know what our next big thing is going to be. We spent earlier this year spending a lot of time going through community ideas, team ideas, just trying to take a real hard look at what is the absolute best thing that we could work on, or honestly, best set of things that we could work on for Toontown next. And we decided that we're working on it now. It is going to take a while. You know, uh, Cellbot Task Force all in all took about like four years of on and off development. Uh, we are going to try and get you guys something a lot sooner than four years, but we don't have anything to announce about it right now. Just know that we are listening to your ideas. We 
have heard them. We're working on something really special that we'll talk about at a future date. <laughs> so now that we've gotten that out of the way, um, I want to start out with a question that was sent in uh, by Paul W389. Uh, this is going to be a, a question for anyone here. Um, Paul said, your ideas for this game are impeccable. I want to know, what is it like to start a Toontown project? What does it take to bring your ideas to life? And what classifies a good idea? So I'll open up to all of you, specifically for Cellbot Task Force. Um, you know, what was it like to create ideas for this expansion? Like, what did it really look like in the beginning when we were kicking this off? And I guess we'll start with Maya, because I know Maya was alongside me back in those early days when we first started uh, figuring out, you know, what we were going to work on here. Yeah, um, I do know that the very first thing that we wanted to do was make sure that we um, test on a small project so that in the future it will be easier for us to do bigger projects. So we thought this was going to be the small project. Um, obviously we were wrong. We did not plan for it to take a few years, but <clears throat> it was a really great learning experience. I believe the reason we picked that one to be the first is because it was one of the only things that we didn't add from Toontown Online yet. and we didn't want to add it as it was before because it felt it always felt like it was a really good idea but it wasn't that exciting for the players it was really like the reward wasn't that great the battle didn't feel like it was harder than any other content so we wanted to take that and give it a new twist and yeah i think that's pretty much how we picked that one definitely um when we first started working on uh, Cellbot field offices, we were honestly trying to decide between are we going to work on the executive office tower and BossBot headquarters, or are we going to work on Cellbot field offices? Those were two great ideas that we had. We knew that players would like either of them, but we felt like the kind of content that we wanted to create for the executive office tower, um, which we still want to create for the executive office tower, was honestly beyond our experience. It we had some we still do have really big ideas for that that we felt like we just didn't quite have enough practice with at the time to be able to execute that so we were like all right we'll do this smaller project first and <laughs> uh, begin with solve out field offices and then four years later it turned out to be not so small after all <laughs> um so now joe rush and gabe you know you guys came in in the middle of solve out field office development yes, yes. um what did it feel like for you coming into the project where it had already kind of been started and some ideas were there? And what what are some of the ideas that you saw change along the way? Uh, I'll let Rush go first, if that's okay. It's throwing me in, huh? <laughs> I'm still thinking. It's, yeah, sure. Uh, it's kind of funny because when I came in, I basically, um, I came in as a trial and I actually was specifically not intending to work on field offices. I was like, you know what, let everybody else deal with that. So I actually worked on next update and I uh, helped out a lot with the 2.9 update. But then at some point it was like, okay, you know, we need all hands on deck. We need everybody to focus. We need every last programmer and every other development person to come in and help out. So I kind of came in and I think one of the first things I worked on was the ice game where I kind of saw where it was and this is about maybe six months to launch i want to say this is like in the middle of the summer and it was like very recognizable as to where it is today but it was not optimized because optimization was saved for for like at some point in the future maybe it wouldn't have even happened so i kind of was like okay well let's work on that and it was just kind of like interesting having all the ideas be pretty much like established and there already but just kind of like polishing it and then just seeing like what what's left to get it to be to that like level of toontown rewritten quality that we're kind of looking for you know um and that was just like really cool to see like a lot of small ideas kind of came out of that like we were playing around with like the camera to try to get it to like feel just right and then a whole bunch of like small ideas of like hey what if we had particle effects on the cabinets to be <laughs> more visible which ended up coming way later with the, uh, you know, the Kaboomberg expansion, the last lap Ooh. expansion. So, yeah, like essentially, like it was 
cool to be able to help out even at that point and just clean up things that were kind of like left for later. Um, yeah, I I share a lot of similar sentiments with Rush. On my end, unlike him, I do 3D modeling. And when I first got on the team, I honestly wasn't sure what I'd expect. In fact, I wasn't really expecting to like work on field offices. I guess my mind was just blank. But when I got on and I saw all the progress that was happening, I was like, oh, geez, how will I be able to contribute here? And um, it felt a little intimidating for me at first, admittedly, because I'm just seeing all this progress and I'm just seeing this update that's been like talked about for a long time now. And it's like, oh, wow, I'm seeing it all for myself. And I was like, how can I help out? And um, initially, I came on as a 3D mod modeler, which I was able to help as with some accessories, like, for example, the... um the um agus of aluminum <laughs> I, I i mispronounced it but uh the, the trash can lid we'll call it that um and a few other things like uh stuff for the last laugh expansion which we'll get to but it was also a learning opportunity for me to learn how to how to do other things i've wanted to do such as animation and when I got in, uh, we still needed animations to be finished, particularly for the um, for um, for the remote controls, as uh, as some of the cog suits uh, like body types lacked them, and it was a perfect opportunity for me to learn. And with knowledge from Roger, love him by the way, he's very wise. <laughs> um, I was able to like help that like dream come true, and also like help the the update get closer to be finished even though like admittedly i didn't feel like i was doing too much at the time i was very happy to have been able to help and i was only surprised to be able to like help a lot more uh with last laugh which we'll get to get to when we do yeah so uh all great answers and really just to go back to the original heart of what paul had asked about what does it take to bring you know, uh, a good Toontown idea to life and how do we decide those ideas? Uh, you know, as you all have been talking, I've been showing some concept art and uh, early model tests for the field office. And for me, you know, that this this concept art shown on screen here, which was by uh, one of our concept artists, uh, Nathan Roberts, it's I feel like- It's actually showing, Joey. We need to see oh, it's it. not showing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess Lappy, could we make sure that um, the the uh, concept art's on screen? But uh, seeing this concept art that I'm sure will pop up in a few seconds here for you guys um, for the first time was I think when the idea of Cellbot Task Force and I guess Cellbot Field Offices really felt solidified in my mind of like this is going to be a really awesome fun experience for people. We had talked about this idea of like a building taking over Tune headquarters for years, honestly, before we even started working on it. Um, and it was always something that we believed in, but like starting to see the building itself and like treating the building as an animated character uh, was, I don't know, it just blew my mind seeing it for the the first time here. And then as it continued coming to life through more concept art and then the the early model tests um yeah it 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 just felt like a surefire thing that we knew that players would would love <laughs> uh, and just to be sure are we um are we seeing the concept art and stuff on screen now yeah yes yes we okay, are perfect. <laughs> love that uh, yes yeah, so I'll, I'll go through these again i was kind of clicking through them but um this, for example, is a really early animation test and uh, one of the first times that we saw the building move. And, and, you know, there's also this little tune reacting at the bottom. And this was kind of our our starting place to define what the personality of the field office was going to be like and how it was not just going to be this awesome boss battle that you can go do, but it was going to be a character that would come into the streets of Toontown and have this really menacing presence. And that was something that really felt compelling to us. Um, 
in in those uh, early days to make it an idea worth pursuing. So um, moving on then to the next question, we have a uh, fitting question from Retro on Twitter who said, uh, howdy TuneCast, I have always been so curious, any chance you'll ever publicly reveal the concept art that went into making the field office update? I'd okay. adore seeing all of the artsy effort that went into designing the website, the comics, and especially the boiler. And you can see already, yes. And we have tons of this stuff that we're going to be showing throughout the entire stream. I will even jump ahead just a little bit to give you a taste of uh, some of the boiler room concept art, if I can find it. It should probably be at the top about this. Yeah, so here's, uh, I know people have seen um, this one before. This was one that we shared at TuneFest one year, uh, but there was way more boiler concept art than this that uh, we will be sharing more of as, as <laughs> the uh, event goes on. So uh, heading into our next question, um, let's see. Uh, so on Twitter, uh, I think this is pronounced Tatake asks, uh, hey everyone, what was the most difficult part of developing Cellbot field offices? And um, it, just since Joe, you haven't really had a chance to answer yet, I'll, I'll start with you. What was the most difficult part for you in creating the audio experience for Cellbot field offices? I feel like audio is uniquely qualified to speak to this question. When, um, when we started off, uh, everyone, every composer, every artist, we all have our own idea of what what the sound is going to be uh, for that goes along with the concept art, the concept slides, and um, it's it, we grow with the uh, with the rest of the project. As the field office came to life, we were figuring out how to create music that gave that field office a voice. And for for audio, one of the biggest challenges was. Finding that middle ground, there were three composers, myself included, working on field offices. Uh, we had to find a middle ground that was um, held to everyone's individual artistic license, but at the same time, um, it was uh, coherent. If you put them all up in a playlist, it, none of them stood out as written by one individual composer. Um, and there was a period of time there where we had to step back and say, none of this matches up. How are we going to, uh, how are we going to fix this? Um, and that cleanup was de definitely, definitely difficult. We tried at first to take some of our beta drafts and just manipulate them a little bit to, to sound more like, and then um, a couple of them we just had to scrap and start over. Um, there's beta versions out there of the boiler theme, of the executive suite or camera room, um, as well as the ice game. Uh, so that was sort of, uh, and I know we've released both the beta and ice game and the the final shippable ice game. And you can kind of get, you, if you look at those side by side, you can see the fruits of that labor. Uh, but that was audio's into things. I don't know if anyone else has anything to share. Yeah, I can talk about art. Um, I think the biggest thing that was harder for us is probably kind of similar. The first room that we worked on was actually the ice game. And we didn't exactly do it in the right order because that was our first time doing um, like a full mini game from scratch. And I think we tried to split the work between multiple people and that resulted in like each one of us working on our own on a few props and they look great and then we put them all in the same room and it looks like it was textured by like five people it probably looked like it was textured by 10 people like it didn't exactly match with each other each thing individually looked really good but the vibe combined together wasn't that great um so we had to go back and do a lot of color fixes to balance things with each other and that was a really big learning experience and i feel like we really improved because every room that we made after that 
I believe the next one was the boiler room. We made the work so much better. Uh, we knew which part to start with first. We did the color concept. And for the boiler, it was like pretty much everything seemed matching from the first try because we had that experience from the ice game. So there were things that were made by like also over five people, but they all look like they were made by the same person. <clears throat> we have um, a really cool concept of the colors concept that we did for the boiler room. I don't know if you can find it. Yeah, I'll pull that up. I just saw it a second ago. Here we go. That uh, should be displaying yeah. on screen, Maya. Yeah. I think it, it's just a little so, behind. That was one of the ways that we tried to apply it. We tried to get like, what is the vibe we want to do? And our concept artist, Nathan, tried to like divide the room to make sure that there is this part on the side that is kind of colder and we'll use colder colors. And then as you move, the room will become warmer and the color palette will kind of change. <clears throat> That is one example of how we try to address that. Yeah, boy, the boiler room is uh, without a doubt one of the coolest rooms in the entire game. And uh, <laughs> it is in large part thanks to just like the hundreds of hours that the art team put into it. It was, a, I, I would say, a really challenging room to create because we have this kind of um, it's a, it's an odd shape, right? Like there's the desk area that leads up to the boiler, and then there's that kind of rounded part that the boiler sits in. And it's a really complex room because it is both a gritty, uh, rusty kind of dirty boiler room, but also an office because we had this really strong idea that we liked. Um, for those who don't know, the boiler room is a play on words because. Uh, boiler room is a term for like really high pressure sales call centers. And so we have the cogs kind of working at the desks in this room being watched by the literal boiler who's putting the pressure on them. And, um, you know, that was like when that idea was pitched, I, I forget who actually came up with that name, but uh, everyone was like, yeah, that's the name of our boss battle. And it's one thing to like have that clever name but to be able to create the artwork in such a way that like you can feel that in the artwork where you see the the desks you see the the boiler looming over you can feel the the pressure of this room and see that that clear split between these two different ideas um while still like married together so well i i could just rave about it forever cuz i i really love the way that this room came about and it took a lot of what? work to get it there I do have Watching more that to come together. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I do have more to add on that. Um, I think there was a question in uh, Twitter that I don't know if you can find, but someone asked, uh, how did we come up with the design of the boiler? Um, and I wasn't sure if mm -hmm. they meant like the art design or the game design. So I figured maybe we can answer both. Um, yeah. Yeah. But... This is a question <laughs> from um, Pan who said, I was wondering if you go in depth on stream about the design process behind the boiler. What inspired its design and how did the team come up with its boss battle concept? Mm -hmm. So Maya, let's yeah, let's start um by talking about the visual design of the boiler and yeah. like the room that it sits in. And then I can talk a little bit about the actual boss battle design of it. Yeah. So our original idea actually started from uh from the fact that on Toontown Online, if you look at the cog buildings, you can see that they have faces. And that kind of indicates that the cog buildings are actually cogs themselves. So that was something that we wanted to explore more with field offices. So we wanted to come up with an idea where you can buy the building and pretty much the building is the cog. So what we did is first we worked on the exterior, but then we wanted to indicate that the boss is not just on the outside, it also has eyes on the inside. And you are pretty much fighting the building itself. So you can see that some of the rooms have um, security cameras that are kind of following you and they look like eyes. 
So this is kind of how the building is watching you when you're inside. And then the boss of each annex, we wanted it to be a part of the building so that you can feel like you're fighting the building itself. So that's how we started being like, what could work well as part of the wall? And that's part of what led to the boss being a boiler. And you can see that the eyes of the boiler are pretty much the same eyes of the exterior, just slightly different colored. And that's because we wanted to indicate to the players that they're pretty much fighting the same entity. Like it's all just one cog that has like eyes in every room and in every annex. Definitely. And, um, you know, you all can see in the concept art that I'm sharing on screen, the actual layout of this room, as well as the design of the boiler itself, went through a ton of iteration. We really wanted to get it absolutely perfect to convey this idea that you were fighting, you know, because it, it is kind of complex, right? Mm -hmm. Like the eyes that you see on the outside of the building are also the eyes you see on the inside of the building. And there's a bunch of different annexes around the building that all have like, extensions of this giant entity that that you're battling um and yeah it it took so much uh work between the designers the artists the whole team really to make sure we we nailed this idea of uh you know what what this boss battle was going to be and and what it was going to look like visually um one of the uh, big things that you see and throughout all these different concepts is, you know, the eyes are always there, but uh, we were trying to figure out what goes around the eyes, you know, like how do we give this boss a sort of mouth and like, what about like, does it have arms? You know, is, is it something that could reach out and like grab tunes? Is it something that uh, is really kind of like stationed to the wall? And we, ended on the design that you see in game where uh we have this kind of like the the furnace part of, of the boiler that acts as its mouth um and then the kind of bellows that are next to it and act as its arms uh not in the sense of like being able to reach out and grab things like hands but still kind of having that anatomy of of a character um and you know it, again major props to all of our uh artist who who brought that to life um another interesting thing that we had uh, going on with the boiler was um one of my my design requests for it is that we would make it a boss that had two elevators and and so you know normally you see on the outside of the building it's almost like the elevator is its mouth and so uh the, with the way it rests underneath of the eyes so that it uh the elevator opens up and then kind of like slams shut and almost swallows up the tunes inside of it. And then that's when you enter the building. And then as you get to the actual boiler part, you kind of see that mouth changes into the actual furnace. So it's a, a more exposed area where if you throw gags into it, it's going to damage the boss. And so that meant um, putting the elevators on each side of the boiler so that cogs can enter from each direction, which Sounds like it's like, yeah, it's two elevators, you know, not that big of a deal. But it was a, a challenge both in terms of the layout of the room as well as the uh, programming that it took to do something like that, since that isn't something we've seen before in Toontown. Yeah, and we actually have images from the prototyping of the room where we first we do. did like yeah. a really rough like 3D model just to show like, is it working? Is it fun? And it didn't have the actual, no, that's just the concept. You have to scroll down more, I think. Oh, I, I already did. It's just, oh, I think yeah. it's lagging behind for you a couple seconds. Okay. So that was, I think, one of the first uh, 3D prototypes. And pretty much we wanted to see, like, what, what does the player first see when they go out of the elevator? How do we build up that kind of vibe? And you can see this is like not the actual model. That's just a really rough prototype. Um, and that's something we normally do when we build new rooms is we try, we just like blocky models and we try to run a tune with them just to see like 
is it fun is that how we want to go do we want to change anything is the scale good and things like that <clears throat> yeah yeah this um this picture you see of sir max here was i believe the first time any of us had actually seen the boiler room model in game before uh you know this early prototype version of it uh i remember being in a call with everyone and we we kind of like live streamed this to you and um looked around together and it it is one of my fondest memories from development is just walking around this room you can see the cogs in the background like kind of a broken battle going on the boss wasn't actually functional at this point but we really wanted to start to understand what this was going to look like in game not just in concept art and uh you know honestly it at, for, at this point it didn't change a whole lot onward uh, you can see this generally is still the same layout that we ended up with um yeah, there were a couple changes say, yeah, one thing you can see is there is this like big lamp above the boss and that's because originally right. one of the ideas was for it to like stomp the tunes and eventually i think we scrapped that and decided to go with like some other stomper that would look more like the like the ones that are, that are on the bellow of the boss. Yeah. Well, so that and... ended up being the the stamp of disapproval. Um, yeah. You know, we had always had this idea of like one of the boss's main ways of attacking is, you know, dropping something on on the tunes or, or smashing them in some way, because since the boss is the building, we wanted to kind of use some of the environment to uh, in its attacks. But so originally we had this really grand chandelier that it would uh, use as a stomper essentially, but we ended up moving away from that idea partially because the room itself, you know, changed into this more, uh, you know, very industrial boiler area where there's a lot of pipes, there's a lot of machinery. So a, a big chandelier didn't quite fit in that theme. And also we wanted to make sure that we were still at the heart of this telling a story of work versus play, where the tunes weren't trying to just vandalize, you know, this building and the building wasn't just trying to hurt the tunes. It all had to be kind of wrapped around the idea that the tunes are just trying to have fun and the building's just trying to work. And so um, instead of the chandelier, it ended up being that a, a giant stamp felt much more in theme with the other cog attacks in Toontown, where uh, yes, it's still pretty violent. It's it's smashing the tunes, but it's doing so in the name of business and uh, leaves this kind of like watermark behind and everything, as opposed to just you know uh, smashing a chandelier for for that sake. And so it's a small thing, but like those are this kind of discussions that we had throughout all of development in how do we. And that's why it took so long. Honestly, a big part of why it took so long is we all care a lot about wanting to give the highest quality experience, the absolute like peak of what Toontown we believe um, is most fun. You know, is when it's fulfilling that work versus play theme and um, giving players these kind of mischievous experiences. I don't want to um, like hop in and just add a couple of like yeah. fun little development tidbits. Um, like when we were talking about the design of the boiler specifically and how he has like these hand stompers. Technically, the stompers are like coded in the uh, the model itself as feet, and so that led to a very funny <laughs> development uh, image. It's slide number one, two, three. If you want to go to that one. Uh huh. <laughs> where oh, we're like, yeah. oh wait, the boiler has feet, right? <laughs> yeah, that so was a really funny had... one. You skipped it. Yeah, Roger just went ahead and made this <laughs> funny little <laughs> video. Oh man, I I remember being in the call that night when he was making it. <laughs> that was so fun. And yeah. then one of the other fun notes is that when we were kind of like thinking about the idea of stamp of disapproval, it kind of went through a whole bunch of ideas. Like I think we initially like when i was first aware of it we started out with like the factory stomper as like a prototype and then when we had the um the normal like under pressure attack with like you know the stomper coming down and the gear coming down uh around to hit the player uh it switched to that model but then we were like well but that's just a stamp like it's not necessarily 
comedic. It doesn't have that punch to it. So I remember it was me and another developer. Uh, we were just kind of like trying to brainstorm, like how would this look? And so <laughs> I had some very very rough, uh, like literally like MS Paint uh, sketches that I would like to share. And that's slide number one thirty four of this is the actual concept art for the stamp of disapproval. As rough as it is, this is oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is what turned into Stamp of Disapproval. I remember being in the call for that, too, and just seeing that in action. I I really love your concept art, man. You, you should be a concept <laughs> artist for the team. Uh, and I just remember that like the damage that we had initially for this attack was very little, but then it didn't feel punishing enough, so it kept going up, too. So that's where the 70 comes from, because this is when we were talking about like the damage needs to be 70. So it became also a little bit of a running joke on the team. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it, it, that's also a really good way, just showing that ideas for this update came from everywhere. You know, it's it's not just like the designers and artists who were putting this together. We were really big about like we want this to be the best Toontown update that's ever been released, and the only way we know we're going to be able to do that is sourcing ideas from all of our team, all of the community. Even you know, we did. Uh, really early play tests for field offices at Toonfest, where people could play kind of just like a, a rough version. It only had the maze game and um, the cog battles and then like the taking away gag mechanics. But um, we used that and then later showed stuff from the ice game to kind of source ideas from the community and like let you guys weigh in with your feedback. And it directly helped shape this update into what it was. Um, and also, while we're on the topic of fun animation, I'll, I'll jump back up to some of the exterior animation, um, because one of the funniest parts of working on this project was uh, <laughs> seeing the crazy things that Roger would put together, in, uh, oh who was you know, one of the other art directors for, for this project, um, and uh, just giving us these hilarious <laughs> things that the field office would do that uh we wished we could have found some way to like integrate oh, into one. the game that was from a different artist uh this was nathan i think this, that uh, one's nathan. yeah that one is nathan and then we have the, the prototype building animation. rising from the depth <laughs> oh yeah well we didn't know the spawn <laughs> animation how it would look so it just materialized out of the ground i rise <laughs> for a while so this one with the field office blowing away was the actual defeat animation like in our development because we didn't have the like the real defeat animation yet and so when you defeated a building on our our development server like this is what would happen to it i wish we had like a balloon sound accompanying it right <laughs> I yeah, lot, lots of fun TV animations office. that happened uh, and just shows kind of some of the, the joy that was put into this update. So I um, jumping back, so we talked a lot about the visual design of the boiler room. I, I did want to talk some about the uh, gameplay design of it. Um, the, the original goal of the boiler room battle from like the earliest days of envisioning field offices was we wanted a Toontown boss battle that made use of turn-based mechanics because the turn-based battles are the heart of Toontown. They're really like the, the majority of most people's gameplay is fighting cog battles to picking a gag, the cog attacks, and um, the uh, existing boss battles in the, in the cog headquarters are a really fun uh, kind of diversion from that where they're more real-time battles, which are super unique and fun. But uh, since we already had four of those, we wanted the boss battle for field offices to instead like put a really hard boss battle into the turn-based system that, that we'd never really seen before in Toontown Online. So uh, honestly, in the beginning, that's all we knew. We, our goal was just, we're going to create a turn-based uh, boss battle. What that looks like, we're not sure. <laughs> And so uh, it was later on when we started talking about what that would look like when the idea of status effects came up. And we're like, well, you know what 
is something that doesn't exist in Toontown and Spouses and that could allow us to do so much, even beyond field offices, are status effects, which, um, you know, as most of you know, I think ended up being a uh, battle mechanic introduced in this expansion where um, you can have effects that linger on cogs or tunes. So you could be damaged over time or heal over time. And uh, that ended up not only playing into the boss battle, but also our rewards for the Solvat Field Office. So we started dreaming up these different boss attacks around the idea of status effects, because we knew this was going to be the content where we introduced those. Uh, I actually have our boiler room design document here, which uh, I don't, has never been publicly shared. Um, some of the content that you might see in this design document is out of date and didn't fully end up uh, this way in the, um, uh, the actual release. But this is what we used as like our designers put together this blueprint of what the battle was going to be and what it was going to look like. Uh, one of our designers, Dante, was a uh, big part of creating those status effects and then also um, kind of creating this proposal for an offensive and defensive battle. Uh, I know he was very much inspired by games like Wizard 101 and other MMOs that have um, boss battles that react to the tunes where, or, or to the players. Uh, whereas traditionally in Toontown, like the cogs, they, they react a little bit to tunes. You know, they might choose to target a tune that dealt more damage to them, or they might um, uh, you know, do little things like that, but they don't ever really change their strategy. Like it's always just attack the tune and uh, just keep laying on damage throughout the whole battle. And it's kind of a random attack sequence. And we wanted to have this boss be a little intelligent where it isn't just like it's going to keep changing things up on you so that you can't just click sound over and over and over again. You can't just coast through this battle. We want you to have to work together, you know, and, and that was the other part of if the first most important thing was um, creating a turn based battle, the second most important thing would have been uh, encouraging some like really robust teamwork and, and uh, encouraging advanced strategies where you have to work together with other people to do this right. Uh, so, so here's our actual design goals for the boss battle. We wanted it to be uniquely challenging. We wanted to bring in some modern MMO mechanics that deepened the, the traditional gameplay. And we wanted it to have timeless teamwork to um, lead people to, again, just like really uh, work together in those complex ways and uh, create friendships out of it. So uh, I'm not going to go through this entire design document, but um, you know, there's a lot of really interesting things in here. This was our, our reference for when the boiler was going to uh, explode. We used the brave little toaster, this uh, very uh, intense scene that some of us may have been scarred by <laughs> as children. But, but uh, uh, it was a really, it really captured what we were going for there. Um, and then let's see if I jump down to some of our attacks. Um, some of these attacks actually don't exist anymore or were renamed to something different in the game. But uh, we had things like heated chatter, which was going to um, uh, you know, release fire from the boiler's mouth and, and hurt the tunes. Uh, market research ended up in there, quality control. Uh, and you can see in, in these images, these are uh, designer artwork, you know, not, not our concept artists working on this, but like designers really just working in Google Slides to uh, create the blueprint and use some really rough and ready uh, uh, images. Like art to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it was really just like using PNGs and stuff like that to convey an idea. And then our concept artists or our 3D modelers could look at these as the blueprint and you know create that what the visual experience was actually going to be like <laughs> one of my favorite ones um from this which which did end up in game was the uh retention plan one where the boss sort of like rotates its eyes and then pulls the cogs back magnetically uh <laughs> to unlure them that was a, a really fun thing that just like immediately when I remember seeing this and thinking, yeah, that that's going to look cool. Um, 
so yeah, lot, lots of fun things from the development of the boiler room. Uh, but we should probably jump into some other questions to make sure that we cover as much as possible. So uh, just looking in at some of the other questions that were sent in ahead of time, and then we'll probably try and get to some in the chat as well. Uh, so uh, this one is a, um, a question for Joe about the uh, music of Salvat Field Offices, as well as you know the, the hideout. Um, Paul asks, as a former music composer myself, I look up to the music you composed for this update. What goes into making a theme that fits with the classic Toontown formula? How do you know what fits and what doesn't? That is a great question, Paul. Um, well, we start in audio with the design documents you see in front of us, or even uh, just a couple of ideas pitched in a chat. We sometimes have very little to go on. Um, and from there, we figure out what that sound is going to be. Now, of course, Toontown has a very distinct sound. The togs, I would say, are definitely easier because it's not a totally blank slate. There is a uh, easily distinguishable melody that is in every single COG track from Street Battles to HQ to Boss Battles, Buildings. And um, so without a doubt, that was that had to go in there. Um, as I said earlier, we all have our own idea of what this is going to sound like. And then as the concept art turns into 3D models, as the 3D models turn into uh, early tests, we are growing and maturing with with them. Uh, I remember watching because I was not I did not have any hand in the boiler uh, boiler room at all. The music, nothing. I remember coming in every day after college classes to my apartment, logging in and just seeing that room take shape, seeing that battle develop and seeing the music um, maturing with that. Uh, and I do see here in the chat, Dan, the man likes the cash spot music. That was me. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so um, it really, you know, for me, it's a big question of what 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 has worked and how uh, do we need to reinvent the wheel? Uh, there's a lot to work with. And then uh, what can we do? What can we do to run with that? Um, the sounds of surveillance is the example I like to go to. Um, but that was pretty much a blank slate. Uh, we, at the time, were calling it the executive suite. It hadn't really uh, developed this identity as the surveillance room, the camera room. And everyone had just said, it, you know, write something that sounds like a bunch of head honchos chilling in their office. Um, uh, so that was... Uh, so I picked up the the battle, the traditional battle theme, created this new melody that we hear across the stomper room, and um, found a really interesting way just to blend the new with the old. And that's really what goes into any piece. How can we make the what's already there fresh without feeling like we're recycling? Absolutely. Yeah, great answer, Joe. Uh, so I've, I've been looking at some of the questions coming in the chat. Uh, there's two similar questions here. One from, I'm sorry if I butcher these these names. Uh, I think it's Patrick Horton uh, on Twitch. And then another from Eper, uh, who said, why did you decide to work on cellbots as opposed to other departments? What attracted you to the cellbots? And Eper said, uh, cellbots are my favorite cog type for sure. But did you guys ever feel like putting too, so much emphasis on cellbot exclusive content might have drawn attention away from the other cog types like lawbots and boss bots. So um, definitely, like I think uh, it wasn't really intentional that we ended up doing so much relating to cell bots in Toontown Rewritten with the, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Operation Storm cell bot and then, you know, field offices. That wasn't really an intentional choice of like, yes, cell bots are the cogs we want to lean in on. Part of it, honestly, was going back to what we talked about where we went into this update wanting to do a little bit of a medium-sized piece of content that would help prepare us for working on 
the boss bot executive office tower. And the maze game already existed from Toontown Online. It was already fully done. We did end up tweaking the balance of it and tweaking the some of the visuals and just making it feel a little more polished. But it was already designed for us. Um, and so we already had one of our two mini games done. And we're like, we could do another mini game. That'll be easy. You know, so we thought. <laughs> um, there was for law bots were considered because we did have a half completed flying game from Lawbot field offices that people have probably seen some of the uh, you know early development videos of from Toontown Online uh, and other servers have have implemented that game as well. But you know we really just wanted to put our best foot forward and have content that was. Uh, you know, going to be a little bit easier for us to create with the experience level that we had at the time, you know, five plus years ago. Um, but, you know, now we're with you. Cell bots have had tons of attention and it's time to focus on other cog types. So you can certainly expect it'll be a while probably before we visit the cell bots again. We want to spend some time, uh, uh, you know, look, spending time with, uh, we've done Crash Cash Bot. Still an open question about whether we'll ever see some law bot or boss bot events, but without a doubt, uh, we want to know more about those cog types because there's a lot to explore with their characters. Uh, a question from TARDIS Man for Maya says, when did new tune outfits come into the development process? And this actually might be a good way to kind of segue into the uh, Cellbot Task Force hideout, which we haven't talked about at all yet. Oh, yeah. Um, so we did want to have, uh, we, I, I believe we always wanted to have some kind of rewards that you could get, but originally we were not fully sure, um, how exactly you could get them or how many you could get. And as we started working on the resistance rank, um, we thought it would be nice to have like one complete outfit for each badge that you can get there. So. That was, um, I think, part of the where I, I'm not sure exactly when that went into development, but I believe it was kind of in the middle, maybe more towards the end, but not too much in the end. <clears throat> what Joey is showing right now is some early concepts for the resistance rank. That was something that um, the hideout wasn't actually originally planned. I believe we wanted to do just the field office at first and then maybe release it later but at some point we realize we need the good way to progress because it's not enough to just have a boss battle if it doesn't actually give you anything so that's when we were trying to figure out how can we continue the task line in a good way and that was something that we came up with and if you will notice about the outfits they kind of develop as you get in higher rank so like the first version is kind of same pro like you're just starting and then as you move forward it becomes a bit of a more advanced version of the former outfit those were made by mike also known as lost hero who did um i believe majority if not all of the of the rank rewards and he also made that pretty gui <clears throat> yeah uh this was um so what I'm showing now with uh, Sir Max at the top, this was the design concept of like what the page would end up looking like for uh, the resistance rank. And then, you know, Mike took this really simple, again, just like uh, slide based artwork here and turned it into uh, an amazing, um, you know, uh, page in the sticker book that uh, you know, the, the general layout was always kind of the same, but it still went through a ton of iteration to, you know, you can see at the bottom, there was a, a point where we had this kind of like crayon idea, like you were coloring in the uh, skill points. We wanted to make sure this felt like a very toony page. Um, there were lots of different designs for this. And the, the crayon still kind of existed in the final version in the icon that appears next to your skill points. Um, but yeah, at one point there was actually a, a crayon in that book. <laughs> Just a little fun fact. Um, and so for the hideout itself, you know, the design end of this, um, about halfway through development, like Maya said, we 
I've been doing a, like a lot of thinking about um, why people will want to do sell about field offices. Like b- besides just it's cool content, it's fun. Like what is the way that you progress as a player? And we knew there were going to be tune tasks, but not quite like what those tune tasks would be. And we kind of had to have this big moment where we started talking about like, uh, is there a way that we could do a new area? And we know that we're already past when we wanted to release for this update, but it just, it doesn't feel right to release it without making sure that it's the absolute best that, that it can be. And so we began talking about, okay, what if it, it, we do a really small room? Like it, it, we were looking at like the Club Penguin secret agent thing as inspiration where it's like, it could just be like uh, the size of one of the shops on the street or something was actually originally how it was pitched. And we all kind of knew right off the bat, it was like, no, we're going to have to do more than that because th- this could be really fun. And um, we, that's when Resistance Rank came to be. And we introduced this progression system that almost works like a hybrid of uh, earning like training gags and also earning cog suit experience. Those were kind of like the two things we drew inspiration from to create this new mechanic, which you know ends up translating to stamps and um, skill points. And then the artist got to work on what is the resistance hideout um you know it, it really early on we decided it would be underneath cellbot headquarters so there were tons of different designs this one was i think was the, the first one or one of the first ones when it was still the idea like yeah this is about as big as a shop interior that's all it needs to be uh just a little secret hangout spot and then it quickly grew bigger and then it grew bigger <laughs> and uh, more and more ideas were added to it. Uh, you know, definitely the definition of of scope creep. But uh, we had so much fun with it. We just couldn't stop. We, were, we knew that this was going to be an area that, uh, you know, you all would enjoy having available to hang out. in. And, and since it was uh, the first tune area that we would have been adding to the game since Tune Fest, we wanted to make sure it was done justice. Um, yeah. And I can talk more about that. Um, one of the earlier concepts that you showed showed some form of like a bed. And I think the one above it is also showing that. And um, mm-hmm. so one of the ideas of how to enter the hideout, one of the early ideas was that people would kind of jump into a tube and will fall into this bed. And eventually we decided to scrap that because it seemed like it would be um, a bit too much scope. Like, what if too many people are falling on each other? And uh, like, technically it just didn't seem like it was the best fit, but it was one of the most early ideas. (laughs) And um, we actually have a few videos that you can show about all of the stages of how the model came to be. I think if you scroll down a bit more. Yes. It should be like eight videos, but they are very short and you can skip them if they're too long. So this is actually going to show the very first um, prototype. It, it's not even the prototype, it's like a concept model that was made by our concept artist Munch. And that was made more so for exploration to show like, is this idea even fun for a tune to run into? What could it look like? So you can see it's a very, very rough um, concept, pretty much. I remember helping Munch learn how to use Blender. And um, admittedly, at the time, I wasn't on the team, so I didn't know what she was working on. And I see now what she was doing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then the second video is um, the first uh, prototype of the actual models. That was made by our 3D artist, Kearns, who pretty much managed this whole room. You can see it looks very close to the final result, but if you have a keen eye, you will notice that it's actually bigger because um, originally we tried like a bigger scale and only after testing it with two and we were like, okay, maybe we should make this one smaller. It feels a little too big, but that was like the very first version of the model prototype that looks most similar to what we have today.
And the next one, I believe, um, was one of the tests for programming for like the locations of the NPCs, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So you will see what uh, a programmer went on, put them where we thought they should be, and then kind of stopped to show each stage. This is like, are we happy about this? Do we want to move this? NPC. You can see that there, there are some that didn't actually make it uh, into the game, or at least not in <laughs> the exact. Yeah, we have uh, Sergey Schnitzel <laughs> and Ali Orangutan, who were unfortunately did not make it into uh, the final release. But I don't know. Maybe we'll see those. Uh, also, also Duke uh, Double Dare, which is a fun name. So <laughs> we, you never know. Maybe you'll see these rangers pop up in the future. And I believe the scale is already smaller in this one. I love having the little tunes there for reference because they really help with the scale. Yeah. <laughs> it's always funny seeing and them deposing. This video, through. I believe, is a test for the tune tasks that you can get there. So it's using a lot of what we call placeholders where we let programmers use just temporary assets just to start programming and see how the idea works. <clears throat> and Gabe, I know you didn't work uh, directly on this layout, I don't think, but do you think you could talk just a little bit about what sort of 3D considerations go into creating like the these different props? So um, I think what like would really help once we get there would be using uh, what I've done for Last Laugh as, as an example, but we'll get there when we do. But um, as far as the hideout is considered, I feel like a lot of things that are considered um, comes down to a few things. Like, what is the first thing that the player is going to see? Where should the player go? And like, what's the important thing like that a player should be focused on? Um, so when the player first enters the hideout, the very first thing they're going to see is the Resistance logo hideout. And to show where they're at, and then as they turn, they see the whole hideout um, in in the distance. And in the middle, you'll see the uh, the foghorns with all of the uh, with all of um, the resistance tunes there, mm -hmm. the quest gear specifically. Um, <clears throat> and they go towards there to get their task. And that's like the important thing to like make sure a player knows where to go. But there's also the interactability aspect of it that's very important as well like for example up in the uh, the second floor where i spy is uh you you have two ways of getting to her either through jumping through the gears or going through the pipeline towards her and not only does it give like options and and allows for like cute decorations like the little scribbles in the pipes <laughs> But it also gives players, like any player, a chance um, to be able to access getting to I Spy easier. As I feel like, considering um, players with accessibility issues, like to be um, really important. So, like, I think it all comes down to like where should a player go, um, how accessible it is. And uh, and just make it feel fun to run around in. And just to give context, that video that you just showed before you moved on, um, mm -hmm. that was the very first version of the model itself. And um, what you could see there, uh, that is a nice story, is that the sign for the um, paddle. Can you stop this this one though? Because that's a different thing. Um, oh yeah. There was the uh, cute sign that has the puddle that you can sleep on. And originally that was meant to be um, on the second floor. Oh, yeah. I wanted that. It to interact mm -hmm. with uh, one of the NPCs to give, like, uh, like I think she was, she liked to make pranks. So it thought that would be cool. And the prank was supposed to be that it's like a non sleeping sign, but instead it says uh, free slides or something like that. <laughs> and that would be um, for people to just have fun, like tunes are enjoying to just slide in. But then I believe it was Joey who said, 
the joke kind of um, goes wrong when it's on the second floor and there is no yeah. railing. And if oh, you slide, yeah. you fall down. So, you know, <laughs> it's not that funny anymore. So we decided to put it down um, to make sure the joke is a little bit uh, friendlier. And uh, that video that you're showing now, that was our very first color concept for the hideout. <clears throat> where um, one of our concept artists once she put in um, like random assets to try and get like the colors and how we wanted to do before we start the actual texturing. So you can see everything in the very first version was much more brownish. Um, the walls were more yellow. Um, and the general vibe is very, very different than what's actually in game <clears throat> yeah i remember we had a lot of conversations about like we love the yeah. general look of this but it doesn't feel cellbot yet you yeah, know like exactly. it doesn't feel like it belongs in cellbot headquarters because it, it is almost a little more boss spot here with those brown suits yeah uh or yeah actually and that reminds me there was a question from uh billy quackington earlier who said i always looked at different Cellbot designs. Some are purple, some are brown. And I want to finalize my question. Are Cellbot suits purple or brown? I think we might be answering here based on how yeah. these colors changed <laughs> that Cellbots are more definitively a, a blue purple kind of suit uh, in their yeah. in the design of their architecture as well. Uh, and boss bots are the brown suits. Yeah. And what you can see in the second one is an attempt to make it a little bit more purple. Uh, but we still felt like it doesn't necessarily feel like it was taken from Cellbot HQ. And the story we wanted for the hideout is that the hideout was taken from Cellbot HQ. It was used by the Cogs in the past, but then the Cogs have left it. And now the Resistance took over it and tried to make the area feel more toony and make it feel more like home. Um, which is kind of tricky to, to do because normally interiors in the game, they're either completely toony or completely coggy. You don't get many that kind of combine both concepts. So it was really tricky to try and get the idea of like, this is a shared area where it was originally coggy, but then the tunes came and made it more familiar. So how do we make sure that that is conveyed um, to the player? So um, we still, that was actually the first version that we showed to QA testers and they did seem to like it, but we were still not feeling um, fully confident with it. By the way, if you see those rainbow textures, that just means we didn't put any placeholder things there yet. So that's how they appear. So oh, something then, interesting. Um, Real quick, just something interesting about that last one too. Some of you guys might have seen that the uh, the gimmick, the TV, the the G I M M I C K was actually in there. It's in this video too, uh, and this is before release. Uh, so you may be wondering what's up with that because the gimmick wasn't actually released until uh, the last laugh. Um, this TV was actually one of the <laughs> earliest props that was concepted and and worked on. But uh, we ended up just feeling like it wasn't a necessity to have it there at release and that it might be a nice thing to add to the hideout later on to make it kind of feel like it's continuing to expand and the resistance is working on improving it. So uh, that didn't come about until a later update, even though it was always planned for the hideout. So that video, um, which I believe is the last one, is where um, me and Mike, the other art director, we decided to take um, another test as we color in the area. And that was our um, second color concept. And you can see that the area feels much more like Cellbot. We took a lot of references from the Cellbot factory. Um, one thing we did was using the kind of pinkish shade on the main poles at the middle and on the tunnel gates because we wanted that color to be used as um, <clears throat> as a way to drag the player attention so that you can see like these are the main uh, poles of the room. And then the other pipes, which originally in the original concept, they were all sharing the same color. 
and we felt like that dragged too many too much attention even to pipes that were not that important so in here we tried to give them a different color that will blend a bit more with the walls that won't grab that much attention so that the pink will be used to draw your attention and everything else will kind of blend and we also tried to think like how do we make this more toony without ruining the area so we figured the tunes could put graffiti on the walls and maybe they will bring uh, plants with flowers just to make it feel more like home. So that was how we decided to make it a bit more toony. Um, you can see here like very early concepts for the graffiti on the wall that just indicated like what idea we want there before we started working on the actual textures. Awesome. Yeah, the, I, I'm so glad that we got the hideout into this update. It was not originally planned. Um, and it's it's what changed this update. You know, when it was first announced, it was called the Cellbot Field Office update. And then when it was released, we had this kind of big reveal. It was renamed to the Cellbot Task Force expansion, just to more encompass that this update really wasn't just Cellbot Field Offices. It was a whole new expansion for the game that added you know dozens of hours worth of content um for the first time in a long time to to toontown rewritten or toontown online so may i bring up one more thing that i forgot to mention it's just more of a trivial of thing um the uh the 2d bench in the hideout that was not planned at all roger dog one night just made a really quick mock-up sketch and he just put it on the wall, and then everyone just unanimously really loved it <laughs> when it was not intended to be there at all. And, and we were like, okay, we love this, so we will keep this here. <laughs> yeah. To this day, it's my favorite graffiti because it's yeah. so smart. It looks like it's just a drone on the wall, but then when you run into it, it actually works. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and that's one like of the aspects of uh, like literally just running into the wall and then like did a really quick like programming like hack together to make the tune go flat like there wasn't any bench support added to it and then i was like oh no i'm gonna have to implement this now <laughs> <laughs> so i had to like rewrite how all of benches work just to make them like able to be flexible enough to handle that and then now hypothetically benches can be anywhere and you can see some of the images now because of that flexibility uh i got another game on the team another artist to uh, <laughs> add in stit points to these chairs in the in the penthouse suite so that i could add sitting to those too uh so a Please question for test. you rush uh this is actually going back over a bit to our status effects now i'll use this as an opportunity to also show some concept art for our status effects and um new battle uh gui but uh, Omni Opal asked, is there effort towards implementing features like status effects in a way that can be easily reused on other future features? If so, how much more difficulty does that add? So yeah, a big part of it was that we had to rewrite the entire battle system in the first place just to even add the idea of status effects. Because to add any sort of this like functionality of field office, like the, the boiler battle into battle one, would be almost impossible. <laughs> we would have taken twice as long to do it, I think. Uh, but the idea was to rewrite Battle 2 to make it more flexible, more dynamic, to be able to add you know, more enemies to the fight. Uh -huh. And then status effects are kind of a way to get around some of the limitations by being able to reuse some of these ideas in a more like flexible way. So some of the ideas are things like damage over time is like a concept that exists that we had to kind of think of. And it's designed internally in a way that's able to be generalized that in the future, if we wanted to have damage over time effects, we have the ability to you know, not just add it, but control how much damage does, control what causes it to change conditions. We have all that kind of infrastructure set up to be able to do that. And a lot of the specific status effects have been designed with the boiler fight in mind, but the system is kind of built to be flexible, and we can pretty easily modify them to get the same behavior, but in different scenarios. So it's, it is kind of designed with all that broadly in mind. I think actually one of my favorite dev notes is that somebody had an idea at some point of like, hey, 
we have all these like holiday NPCs walking around. Could they join a battle? And then <laughs> I think we had like a like one very long dev night where I think it was like TRD and Sketchy were just like in a group call just trying to make it happen and they managed to pull in like holidays like on the street into a battle and then be able to like take damage and like throw a snowball at a cog and the fact that that's doable in 24 hours means that we have a lot of flexibility Definitely. i don't know if we want to do that for sure but yeah yeah well the, and one of the other things in terms of just like the reusability of status effects is um you know, when when we were designing them, uh, you know, on, on the more conceptual side, design wise, we wanted to make sure that it was a feature that wasn't just exclusive to the boiler. Like, it's not like this is something that only happens in the boiler battle. Uh, we want it to be something that fundamentally changes Toontown and, and adds something onto the battle system that we haven't seen before. And that can introduce new strategies so that it's not just the same gags that we've been using for, you know, almost 20 years now. Um, and so uh, part of that actually was making sure that status effects were introduced on earlier gags so that things like lure and trap actually show as a status effect now, uh, even though you know nothing fundamentally changed about the way those worked. We wanted to make sure that people knew about status effects, like new players to Toontown, not just you know people who had been around for a while, but like uh, we want to make sure that the boiler battle isn't the first time you see a status effect like that high pressure situation you don't want to be trying to understand what this icon is for the first time really and so uh we intentionally made sure to put it into uh gags and um also sos cards so that you saw it in other parts of the game before doing your first boiler battle um and you can certainly uh expect that future Toontown written content will be making use of these status effects and bringing them to other areas of the game and, um, you know, new ways that we actually have a whole document of status effects that we brainstormed and kind of decided like all of these status effects would be great for Toontown. And I think I want to say the, these numbers are exact, but we, we had something like 20 status effects written on that document. And I forget how many we actually implemented in total for this update, but it was, uh, you know, half of that or, or, you know, something of the sort where we have a whole bunch of other status effect ideas that uh, we want to bring in in the future that are we're kind of keeping in our back pocket for uh, the right battle and, uh, you know, the right gags to be able to use them on. Um, so before we jump into the uh, um, last laugh portion of our stream here, where we talk about that later expansion we added on to the Cellbot Task Force, um, Maya, do you want to talk to us a little bit about the art artistic process yeah. for redesigning the battles in Toontown? Yes. Yeah, so um, first, I want to give a big, big, big shout out to Nathan, our concept artist and texture artist who worked on this because he spent forever applying feedback from a million people. Uh, and this whole system has so, so many layers and pieces that he had to put together so definitely props to him and all of the credit to him um but originally so originally the idea was that wasn't even related to field offices we just wanted to add some indicator to um when a gag is organic and we wanted to add an indicator of what sos card is being used so we were like okay we should probably redesign the the tune panel at the bottom and that was his tasks or originally. And as he started working on that, we realized that we probably will need to redo the whole thing for field offices as well, because now you will have to attack five cogs and not just four. And we need to add a new reward into the into the panel. So um the main thing we wanted to keep in mind in this process is that. This is a GUI that people were used to for over 10 years in the original game and a few more years in our version. And changing that can be really, really difficult for people who already got used to the old one. 
So we wanted to make sure that no matter what change we do, we try to stick to the original look as much as possible. We try not to go too different. We want this to feel so familiar that if you um, didn't play the game for many years and you came back, you might not be able even be able to tell that it's different than the original one, <clears throat> that it wasn't always there. Um, we we didn't know that on release, many people will struggle to still change. But I think after you get used to it, many people tend to forget that it wasn't always like that. Um, we went through many, many, many different versions of how to include the rewards or how to make sure that it sticks to the original look, but also will be expendable so that we don't have to change it again in the future. Uh, the one you are showing right now with the fire is originally we figured what if each reward will have its own tab uh, just so that our, they're all matching, but eventually we decided fires didn't really need uh, an extra click for you before you can fire. So that one should probably not be a tab. You can see that in the original uh, version, there was this green thing that was supposed to be behind the red one. And when you switch into it, you will see the reward and you will also see um, the calling a friend menu. And I think eventually we decided that calling a friend is pretty much just a waste of space. If you could access your friend list while in battle, that you won't have to have the list there and you won't have to spend the whole turn for it. Uh, and we decided to combine the red and the green into one big section, try to save as much space as possible uh, and make it expandable like that. So you can see there were many um, different versions until it got into what it currently is, which I hope people are used to by now. Yeah, I, I have to say, like, the I'm, a, I'm very proud of our team for a lot of things in this update. But I think the battle GUI is one of the things that I'm most proud of that, that we were able to create. Because like you said, Maya, like, hopefully people don't even realize that it's new. Like, if you hadn't played the game in a couple of years or even since Toontown Online and you booted up Toontown You're Written, hopefully you, it just kind of like you tune it out and and we something that was really important to me that I talked to Maya and Nathan a lot about and and probably the source of a lot of their headaches with it was this should feel like uh like Toon Toontown battles like we said earlier are the part of the game that people spend the most time in most people spend the most time in and they've been used to this interface for over a decade so we want to make sure that it's new and updated, but also we don't want to eliminate the nostalgia that people have for the original game. Because a lot of people do play Toontown Written just because they want to play the same game they played as a kid. And so we didn't want to go so far off that like it didn't create those same warm feelings in you that you had as a kid that like rem remembering what this panel looked like. And um I I really think that we nailed it, and uh, it's just major props to all of the artists, and especially Nathan, who spent so many hours and so many months, even just getting this to the point where it felt authentic to the game. It felt like something that could have always been there. You know, that's the best compliment that we can get. Is I love when people think that deer and crocodiles were like in the original game because the artist did such a good job at making them feel like the original tune models and this is another one of those things like it i i love when people don't even realize that it changed um because it clearly did this is way higher quality way easier to use and more intuitive than the old menu um but it's it's very much in in the realm of inspiration from it and drawing the best parts of it without overwriting them Uh, you can see here there's also some concepts for the the Goofy's Gag Shop uh, redesign that arrived in in the last laugh update. And that was the same thing. You know, we wanted to uh, improve the panel, but not overwrite it. We wanted to make sure that it was still going to be as uh, authentic to the original game as possible. I don't know what this is doing here. Oh, <laughs> I, no, it's a 
dev image of uh, some of the bugs that we had. When <laughs> <we're doing it. laughs> Actually, yeah, there is a, a question. Oh, sorry. Oh, the, there was a question that that this is a good thing for. Uh, Captain Gus asked, "What's the funniest bug that you guys ever found while working on field offices?" Oh, oh, there's too many. <laughs> oh yeah, there there's too many as well. I I had some while I was playtesting. Uh, the thing for last lap, we'll get to it, but. I remember one of the uh, the bugs, especially when QA testing, randomly when find the boiler, the boiler would just instantly teleport in front of the tunes, and it would be really scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have an image of that on slides? Uh, I'm do. looking for it. I'm not sure if we do or not. We do. But while I look for it, does anyone else have other bugs that were, were particularly funny? Yeah, just oh, to dear. like put words to that uh, image of the doodle playing dead with eyes clipping through. Uh, so I wanted to shout out Mark <laughs> for doing like 85 or probably even 90% of the work on implementing the GUI in game. Uh, he he was an absolute rockstar for getting almost all of that done. And then like there's just a little bit of polish from other programmers. Like I worked on implementing like the doodle like section a little bit and getting some of the tricks uh, up and running. And my job was to throw in Easter eggs into the battle GUI a little bit. So I made it so that when you click the buttons, it makes the doodle do a trick, like a preview of the trick. Um, and also one thing that kind of like frustrated me was that the uh, fire button, when you clicked on it, it didn't do anything because it looked like a clickable button, but you couldn't do anything with it. So I made it so that it really angrily kind of like shook and gave you like a little bit of haptic feedback. Like, no, you can't, you can't push me. I don't do anything. Um. Yeah, there were a lot of funny bugs in relation to the boiler battle because it, it was such a complex battle to program too we had to solve a lot and also big props to our qa team who helped us track down every single little issue the most random things that they would try and like find bugs for us um you know they did such a great job and the update wouldn't have been nearly as polished without them Chairs were especially a mess um, for a bit. Um, the chairs in, inside the executive suite for field offices. Uh, oh, so, yeah. um, sketchy. Great answer. Too, more... Chad is also uh, <laughs> saying his favorite bug, which is when you know, he implemented the god rays in the boiler room, which is basically like the kind of like shining uh, light coming from the windows on the side. He added a UV scroll to make it so that it would, you know, slowly kind of shimmer in the light. But then when we were optimizing the boiler room, we flattened all the like textures down into like one and that ended up scrolling the entire boiler room. So the whole thing was just shimmering. It was horrifying to watch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful. So uh, I'm going to do a quick speed run answering a few questions from the chat, and then we can also start talking about uh, the last laugh update. Um, while I do that, I will also kind of scroll through some of the sketches and, and uh, artwork that ended up being our feature pages. Um, if you go to tune.town slash cellbot task force, or I think it's even just task force, um, you can see these pages. Some of you probably remember them from when they released. And it was a really awesome part of this update was getting to create these giant feature pages on the website with tons of new artwork that really helped us uh, build up the excitement of uh, the Cellbot Task Force release. And we did this like kind of three day uh, release for them. So you, you see on the left here, uh, I think this was something that I had done just to kind of mock up like a general layout of the page and then um, June and Mike came in on the right to start putting together like, you know, how does this layout actually turn into artwork? Uh, so I'll, I'll keep going through these, but I am going to look at some questions. Um, Jackie asked on Twitch, uh, what went into designing the task force Rangers? How did you guys come up with the other characters? Uh, actually, sorry, I think that was YouTube. Um, so the Task Force Rangers uh, were a really fun part of creating the story of Cellbot Task Force. We wanted it to not just be your typical like 
you know, MPC saying, go here, then go here, then go here without like a lot of meaning behind it. We actually, we wanted to be building up this bigger plot that, uh, you know, the, the Kaboomberg story that we later revealed and, and we'll talk about. Um, but part of that was creating really interesting characters that we haven't seen before in Toontown, like different types of personalities. One of the big considerations was um, something that has uh, kind of come about in through our past content with Crash Cashbot and um, the Storm Cellbot is the tune resistance is actually kind of a primarily uh, like majority female organization. There's a lot of female resistance ranger tunes and uh, we really liked that. We wanted that to be kind of ingrained into uh, the characters that we were creating for uh, Cellbot Task Force because th honestly, the, like, I think most of our NPCs in Toontown and the um, uh, main task line are male characters. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact percentage of that, but I think it's pretty safe to say that the majority of NPCs you talk to are male tunes. And uh, that, I think, was largely a result of you know, the time that the, the old era in which Toontown was developed and the, the structure of the development team was you know, mostly white male developers. And, um, you know, we, we were intentional about wanting to have more representation. So we not only have our uh, three female resistance rangers in the Cellbot Task Force, but we also have Dr. Googly Moogly, who was our first non-binary NPC. And, um, you know, those characters were developed in a really thoughtful way by our creative writing crew to make sure we were doing representation right and that we were able to um you know just allow people to see themselves in these different characters and and um you know just introducing new types of npcs that didn't fit the traditional mold that you see of other characters in toontown uh so uh, you know i we're giving out a lot of major props but i do have to again say major props to the creative writing team for coming up with not only just a really awesome and extensive story that plays out in those tasks but also uh fun characters who are uh you know represent the the whole of the toontown community and allow more people to be seen through them that uh we just haven't gotten as much of a chance to do in toontown before uh the boiler was also part of that the the boiler we've said um it, you know primarily goes by they them pronouns and uh is gender fluid so he him she her they them is uh, you know, any of those work for, for the boiler because it, it's a boiler. It's, it's a giant building. <laughs> uh, and that was just another way of like finding ways to kind of include some representation in Toontown for types of characters that, that we haven't seen before that represent, you know, real people in, in real life that uh, maybe haven't seen themselves represented in a video game like that. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that we have here is let's see gonna find a good one um <laughs> this is a uh funny one any chances of a new eyewear accessory of the boiler eyes uh my could you talk about some of the unused accessories yes, that, that so, we ended up not releasing <laughs> uh yeah we actually had uh some form of an attempt for it by one of our artists named Da. But we were not entirely sure, like, once we saw it in action, we didn't feel like it exactly fit with the rest of the accessories. So we decided not to release it at the time. Uh, but who knows? Maybe someday we will. <laughs> it kind of gave a feeling of, like, um, you want to say, like, like an anime game rather than Toon Town. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, very anime eyes, honestly. <laughs> Which I love, but I do agree with Maya. They kind of don't fit. Yep, sorry about the technical difficulties, everyone, if you can hear us, but we're, okay. we're working on them. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. Uh, so I was saying we wanted to make sure that we reveal on each day the exact parts that we want to be seen without leaking too much. Um, so. 
you can see that there were parts that we originally kept out of uh, showing through the whole development process. And they were definitely the parts that we showed a little bit more. So um, you can see the the ICM, I think, was on the first page and, you know, the things that we definitely talked about a lot. And then we wanted it to slowly reveal things as we move on. I believe the Butter GUI, which was meant to be our one of our biggest reveals that we didn't talk about on purpose before release, um, was on the last page. And then we kind of debated if we should have concept of the bus itself, like the boiler or not. So you can see in the very early version that he showed earlier, you could only see the eyes at the bottom, but you could not see the actual boiler. But at the end we did decide, you know, it's fine if it's brand art and it, it still won't ruin the surprise too much. It might even get people excited. So it was like at the end of the last page, at the very bottom, so that as you scroll down, you will have this like shock effect of like finally seeing it for the first time. So there was a lot of process like that, making sure what to show and when. Yeah, I'm sure it doesn't look uh, great on my screen since I know it was cropped a little weirdly, but I, I am just kind of scrolling through the the final pages now. Uh, and you can still view these at tune.town slash task force. So I would definitely recommend you go uh, check those out and just you know appreciate with new eyes now that you've seen the, the concept art of just how much went into not only the update itself, but creating, uh, you know, this, this was all for the community. You know, it was all for the sake of how can we make sure that this is the most exciting release possible for all of you? Because we knew that, you know, it had been a couple of years. People were kind of tired of hearing about Cellbot field offices. And they're like, ah, can you guys just release them already? And uh, we didn't want that to be the mood going into this expansion. You know, we wanted it to be a celebration. And so we did a lot of work, not just in creating the expansion, but also in the build up to it, our uh, brand art, our marketing team. Uh, you know, separate from the development team, was working on uh, shaping what this big release was going to be, so that would mark a momentous occasion for uh, Toontown. And you know, I think we did. Uh, hopefully, you guys agree that I think we did a really good job of that. Um, we also had the so, comic I, and a lot of ARG. Oh yeah, the comic. I man, we didn't even put any work in progress. Uh, pictures of the comic on this, but uh, that's a whole other thing that we could go into in the future. Uh, I don't know, maybe maybe some future uh, Toonfest panel or something. We can kind of dive into the the process of of creating things like that. But you know, we we're going to work towards wrapping up here. And um, there's one last thing, a big thing we need to talk about, which is the last laugh update, which kind of brought. Uh, closure to this big story we had been building up through the Cellbot Task Force expansion. So I am going to put a big warning out there. If anyone hasn't gotten to the end of the Cellbot Task Force Toon Tasks yet, uh, be warned, spoilers lie ahead. There is a really uh, big conclusion to uh, Cellbot Task Force that is best experienced for yourself in game. So if you have not seen that before, I would Recommend, you know, feel free to mute the stream or, you know, close the tab. Feel free to wrap up here. I think the, the rest of the stream will just focus mostly on the the last laugh update, which added this conclusion. Uh, so just going to say three, two, one. We're going to talk about spoilers. So you have been warned. <laughs> um, so the, the big spoiler is, of course, for, for those of you still here with us who have seen it, the cogs took over Daisy's gardens, uh, Daisy Gardens. Sorry, and uh, this was actually kind of a late thing. It, we started work on it before Cellbot Task Force even came out, um, and and it was kind of a big question of like, are we actually going to do this? Like, uh, it was kind of pitched as like, um. Well, it, the way it came about actually is so Jake is uh, one of our creative writers and designers. 
he is one of the main people who worked on the tune tasks for for Salvat Task Force. And you know, he was working with me a lot. We would go back and forth in reviews, talking about what is the story we're trying to tell, what is uh, what are we building up to here? And um, originally, I think Jake had this idea of talking about like the, like the cogs were kind of building up to like uh, putting field offices across all of Toontown, and and like we had to stop them from doing that. And the feedback I, I gave him was, you know, if we keep talking about that, like the the more that we bring up in the dialogue, like there's some kind of big thing that the cogs are planning. Honestly, I, as a player, I want to see it. You know, it, it's one thing to talk about it in the dialogue, but uh, I feel like if we are going to talk about a big cog plot to to take over Toontown with field offices, we need to see it play out to really pay off. Like, uh, that level of satisfaction of like, oh my gosh, like this this is actually happening. And so in the buildup to... Um, Kaboomberg. There's a lot of foreshadowing about Kaboomberg um, throughout. Even when we first released Cellbot Task Force, um, our our cinematic video that takes place is uh, uh, called Catastrophe in Kaboomberg, and we introduced the idea of like, oh, there's a district in Toontown you've never heard of before, but it exists called Kaboomberg, and Kaboomberg security is a little lax. The Cogs have been able to uh, sneak in there a little too often. Um, because uh, for whatever reason, Tune Headquarters, ha- you know, has uh, had some incidents there, and we had this newspaper that you can see on the um, uh, bulletin board in the Cellbot Task Force hideout, talking about Kaboomberg, and we knew uh, even at that point we were going to build up to this story where a field office takes over Daisy Gardens, the playground, and and Cogs enter the playground for the first time since the Toon Council presidential election. And that was big. That was like, can we actually pull this off with the level of detail that it needs to have and the the amount of time we have left? Because this was a late breaking idea. And um, we knew that we weren't going to get it in in time for when we wanted to release last year in December. And so we were okay, kind of like, okay, we'll hold it back for a later update because there's already enough for people to spend time with in the Cellbot Task Force to start with. And then a couple months later, when we've had more time, we'll try and release this. So, um, you know, we ended up, uh, this was a really quick uh, prototype that I had put together of what would it look like if we just take some cog props and put them in Daisy Gardens, just like uh, a couple cog buildings, And it was really just that, like all it was is like, let's replace the buildings in Daisy Gardens with cog buildings. And maybe that's all we need to do. And then, you know, the art team looked down and was like, no, we need to do more. If we're going to do this, let's do it right. And so this is where Gabe came into the picture. And I'll I'll pass it to you, Gabe. Yeah, I remember um, in those earlier pictures you set up, um, I basically set up what you had, but on the modeling end. And as you could see, if... um, uh, it was very early, and we just set it up. And like you said, we just thought we were just going to place a few cog buildings, and I had fixed like a few clipping issues and such. But then uh, we decided to have a really big meeting around it that, <laughs> and Rush can say, and I believe so can Maya, that lasted for like four or five hours, <laughs> um, because we weren't entirely sure um, how we wanted Kaboomberg to look um, artistically. Um, and in fact, originally, um, we uh, we made an, an oopsie um, earlier in this year. It was an accident where we did accidentally leak what uh, what Joey had. <laughs> um, and I remember at first, alongside the rest of us, being um, being scared, like, oh, gosh, no, this leaks. But then we thought, little do they know that it's going to look drastically different because... Let's be honest, we did not like um, how Kaboomberg looked. So we looked at it um, artistically. We uh, we thought, hmm, how do we like want to change this up? Like, how much have Cogs invaded this? Is this fully Cogified? Partially? Um, do we want to be able to go inside the buildings? How do we want to block off uh, people going through the tunnels, etc.? 
And for me personally, this was a really big undertaking as like it was my first time personally like working on level design and working on new props which as you can see on the uh in the video there the on you the unused cog bench which makes me really sad that it didn't make it in but maybe one day it'll make it in oh and this video that's showing right now um so we have an ability um, in our pipeline where we can replace models, like any sort of model with anything. And in that video, as you saw, um, Roger showed me how to replace a green hat with Kaboomberg. Um, if you, Joey, if you put on the next video, uh, I believe it's, uh, I think it's slide 422. Yes, slide 422, I believe. Uh, that's me in game <laughs> with the hat, um, and it and it would send me flying because it has collisions, and <laughs> and the whole point of that test was to make sure um, that we could, I I would be able to change the like models so that I could play test it in game, and this really helped easily with the pipe with like being able to change up the pipeline uh beta test in the pipeline i mean sorry <laughs> um i was able to like uh diagnose a lot of things like hmm what collisions do i want to want to change do these collisions feel good and there were a lot of collisions that needed changing um and as you saw in that video right up there uh that's actually a really funny bug i had earlier where like sometimes when you spawn inside kaboomberg um a cog would immediately initiate battle <laughs> with me and I couldn't do anything. I, I would just be caught. And in this video here right now is um one of our tunes, one of uh, our staff members putting on just like trying out accessories and they also had Kaboomberg like on there <laughs> locally and they forgot so like they changed it to the green hat and then they just go flying into outer space. <laughs> and I remember being in the voice chat and and he was like, whoa! <laughs> It, it was really funny. It, it was really funny. Oh, in this video here, we were uh, testing um, how many cogs we want in the playground. And in this video right here, it's we were testing the battle cells because we added battle cells later on. And as you can see, the two faces like, nope, I'm just going to completely ignore you. <laughs> it was really, it, it was really silly. We just had like, a lot of silly little things like that. And we also had like a relatively small budget on Kaboomber 2. Oh, and the small text on the <laughs> Cellbot HQ. I remember when you put that there, Rush. <laughs> yeah. uh, Joe, could you tell us a little bit about the the music for Kaboomber? Because that was. Yeah. Uh, I, actually, so someone asked me once, I think on Reddit or something, they asked me what my favorite Toontown music from this expansion was, or maybe it's the favorite Toontown music in general. And this was before we released the last laugh. And I told them, I like, I can't tell you yet. It is a track we have not released yet. And just wait, you'll hear it. And so this was right. like the, the cog Daisy gardens music, I think is my favorite track that we've ever made for the game. So what was that like for your, for you? It's, it's super nostalgic going back to these, um, these clips, here because i remember sitting in i think it was i popped into that four hour meeting for a little bit and was watching you guys started to develop throw around some concept ideas and the, i just remember staring at it and the first thing i asked was what what is playing in the background and um i remember you and everyone else was completely silent it was like uh the cellbot factory music the uh, HQ music and I was like no 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 and I just remember like this wave of inspiration came over and it was originally the way this piece developed was I tried over doing this pseudo artistic overlay of Big Daisy Garden themes but it was still inherently still about HQ um, but the two tracks just didn't mesh together the way I wanted to so then it was um well, let's try and make it or sell bot HQ and then morph into something more more intense. So it's not recognizably Daisy Gardens at first, but 
um, after the first few bars, uh, what you think is Cellbot HQ. Now you got the melody from Daisy Gardens, and it grows and it grows until we realize, like, when I think once we realized this was the climax of the task line, um, the the piece just opens up into Daisy Gardens, um, but life or death scenario, uh, very big and cinematic, and um, I just remember this. It, really did write itself as um we explored the concept but i i have i have fond memories of cranking this thing out um there were like three or four different versions um before the final one uh there were a lot of late nights in between schoolwork on this one i remember that <laughs> yeah yeah the i i again i love that we were able to get kaboomberg to be an actual thing it it is the coolest thing I think we've ever been able to do in a, a tune cog story. And uh, oh, it's yeah. just the perfect combination of, you know, Gabe and Rogers uh, layout that they, they transformed Daisy gardens into a cog headquarters and then Joe and with the music. Oh, and lost hero. Yes. Mike, um, you know, the it art was direction was phenomenal. The, the audio direction was phenomenal. The story surrounding it was built up in such a perfect way. Uh, I saw a question from Impeccable Shenanigans who asked, uh, what was the inspiration for calling the last storyline as Water Spout? Uh, and that was simply uh, the Daisy Gardens headquarter, headquarters is a, a water spout. You know, it's a watering can. And so we wanted to start uh, building up, like t giving you some foreshadowing of this Operation Water Spout, as it were, and uh, keep you guessing about what that actually meant. And I remember having a conversation with Jake and, and kind of giving him the direction of like, as you, we build up to this moment, like the, the feeling that we wanted to create in players was like, wait a second, are they going to drop a, a field office in Daisy Gardens? Like, no, they're not going to do that. Like, they can't. Are they really? And then like you get this big reveal where it actually happens and there's that cool intro movie where it's it's revealed to you um and yeah i just i i love that we were able to do that and it was a, a big part of the direction for this was like wanting players to think we would never actually do it and then kind of pulling the rug out from under them to be like surprise we did it <laughs> <laughs> um maya i know you have a fun story uh, we talked a little bit about how the uh, layout uh, the early layout for this playground was accidentally leaked in an update. Um, but uh, there was another occasion where I think you accidentally <laughs> might yeah. have um, done something. Yeah, I feel like I have to confess about this because I have actually seen people ask about it when it happened. <laughs> so when we first released the uh, that second part of the update, there were a lot of new tasks that required high-level field offices. And we didn't have them properly balanced to account for so many people needing them. So they would close very, very early. And nobody would be able to actually enter and do their tasks. So until we fixed that, we wanted to like manually help people. <clears throat> so those of us with higher access, we decided to use commands to summon field offices for people to use. Now, in order to do that, you have to type a command that you want to summon a field office, and in the end, there is a number. Now, you know, uh, normal people count one, two, three, and some people, like programmers, they start counting from zero. So in, in order to summon, like, a level one field office, you have to type zero. In order to, to summon a level two, you have to type one. And if you want a level three, which is what I wanted, you have to type two. But I forgot that this is how it works because my mind doesn't count like that. <clears throat> so I accidentally typed three, and apparently that summoned a four-star field office on the first day in the middle of a random street. And I didn't even realize, because I didn't know that that can even happen. And then within seconds, Everyone in the team were like, Maya, Maya, that was a four star. That was oh. not a three star. You just like the, the biggest part of the update. And I started to panic. I didn't know how to undo it. And apparently the whole thing lasted for like, I think up to two minutes until someone yeah. told me how to remove it. 
but during that time, people actually managed to get screenshots of the street sign and um, two groups, I believe, have actually entered the building and I stressed so much. I felt like I really messed up. Um, and I think uh, as soon as we, like, as soon as I removed it, that kicked them out. So nobody understood what was happening. And we decided to just like casually ignore it. Hope nobody thinks that's actually future content that you're supposed to discover later. And <clears throat> the funniest part was like later on the day I was in the ice game playing with random people. And one of them was asking me, so what was that thing with the four star earlier? And I didn't know how to tell them like that was me and that was not supposed to happen. So I was casually just ignoring the question. Pretending I didn't see it. <laughs> um, we did yeah, yeah. um, command afterwards that they could never <laughs> happen again. Now it'll just be like, hey, yeah. are you sure you want to summon a four-star field office outside of Kaboomberg? Wink, wink. Yeah, I felt so <laughs> guilty at the time. And I, I was, at first I was sure nobody would actually notice, but apparently some people actually managed to get in and they only, I think they only saw the first room, so it didn't leak too much. But they did see the GUI showing, uh, I think, Loden in there instead of a yeah. normal cog. I saw their screenshots of that. But it was only two groups, and I like specifically made sure to like track down like their progress. Like I saw them go in by like the logs, and then I saw that every single one of them crashed when you got rid of it. So I was like, okay, there's no more threads. Nobody's in the field office. We're good. <laughs> so they only got a maximum of two minutes in. So the most they could have done was like started the battle. And then that wouldn't have spoiled too much. Besides, like, I, I guess maybe they would have seen more cogs than normal. Rush was in the surveillance room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the in game surveillance room, just watching them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for all the, uh, I, like, I'm sorry, Maya, that you, you had that stressful moment, but I, it is nice. We can at least look back now and laugh about it. And, like, e even in the moment after it happened, I feel like we were kind of able to be like, well, you know, that happened it, it it's out there now but it's fine we know players are still going to love what what we have to show them later on uh and there were there were lots of moments that, like that from field office development up until release even during release i remember many of us were kind of camped out uh hidden inside of the uh hideout like we you know we were invisible and kind of watching for waiting for the first players to show up there uh, and see their reactions to the hideout. Um, we were watching the streams from from Toontown content creators who were going into field offices. I, I vividly remember that uh, seeing the first stamp of disapproval hit someone and they were like freaking out about it. I can't remember which streamer it was, but uh, man, it, it this update just has so many great memories associated with it, hopefully for you all as well. It's been able to create many great memories for you. Um, just as a final question for us to wrap up here, uh, can each of you share briefly just like your favorite memory, either from the development of uh, the Cellbot Task Force or um, you know a memory that you've made since it has released in the past year? Hmm. That, that's um, a tough question. I need to think about it. You want to go first, Maya? Yeah, I think my favorite memory was definitely watching the streams of people if they played it for the first time. There were many people who shared it, and I think people don't always uh, know what it feels like from the other side, but when you work on something for so, so long, you really, especially if you do this as a volunteer thing, and you do it for the players, you really want to know that they are actually enjoying it, and that they're actually having fun. So all of the first impression that a lot of you recorded we were watching every single one of them that we could find and every one of them was so exciting every time people saw something for the first time and their reaction to the art to the music <clears throat> to the gameplay that was all really really awesome that was definitely my my favorite part of it uh, rush what about you so this isn't my favorite part, but I just kind of remember like in the day of launch and like the days afterwards, I, I was like, I had every single stream like pulled up across all of my monitors, just like watching everything. 
uh, I felt like I was sitting in this surveillance room just watching all nine, you know, screens at once. And I remember I was even like going on and playing some field offices with players the first couple of days just to kind of like see what they were thinking, see what they were experiencing. And I I like to think that I was like, I hopefully convinced some people to use like a whole Korean pie in the first round of the boiler because <laughs> that was the dev strategy when we first started out with that. Um, but honestly, I think just some of my favorite parts were like those initial moments, like just seeing like after everything had gone live, like even after having seen field offices for months, like you would think, oh, the magic is gone. You know, like I, I already know everything about like there's to know about field offices. Uh, but just like seeing it all come together, seeing it finally like officially in the game, seeing that V3.0.0 in the bottom left of my login screen, and then just like knowing everybody is being able to be the fruits of our labor essentially that just kind of was like one more magical moment for me and i just was buzzing for weeks afterwards like even you know staying up late fixing bugs every day uh just like watching all the people crashing and trying to like cut down all those crash logs day after day like it still felt like magic absolutely uh what about you joe I think my favorite memory from Task Force was shortly after launch, uh, actually getting to experience a field office for the first time. Uh, I was never, you know, uh, play. I never played any of the QA tests. I operate off of a potato for a computer, so um, I can run the game, and that's about it. And so I remember. Um, it was me and pretty much the audio department or all that was left. So it was me, Wood, and Clark who did our sound design, uh, some of our sound design. And we were like, hey, let's, uh, and then Taha was there and he was basically a honorary member of audio by that point. Um, so there was the four of us that this impromptu field office run live. Um, and it was my first time experiencing all the hard work that audio had done all rolled up into one place other than seeing the progress updates and actually getting to do it. And so there was this combination of the wow factor along with the stress of, I had no idea what the strategies were. None of us really, I don't think anyone in audio really did. We were just like, here's the music goodbye. <laughs> so um, just figuring it out like a new player, um, like um, at the same time as getting to hear the finished product, see the finished product, and how it all fit together. It, I'm not going to forget it. We all died in the boiler. It was great. <laughs> um, yeah. Go ahead, Gabe. Oh, man. like I, I'm still not sure where to begin, but I think... I think in terms of development, just... um. I will admit, initially when I was working on field offices, as I said earlier, I didn't feel like I, I had much at stake. I was glad that I was able to do a contribution. But when I got to Kaboomberg with the help of Roger, Lost Hero, and Rush, and, and really some other people that were involved, um, I remember like feeling like in intimidated, like, oh gosh, um, will I be able to deliver this? Like this is exciting that people will see this but will i be able will we actually my bad be able to deliver like the development of it learning level design working on it it was so fun learning all these cool tools like seeing all these silly bugs it was really fun but much like everyone else like i think the sentiment that will always stick to me is when it comes out and people see it and, and if their reactions are positive, I tend to, well, I'll be honest, scream like a little girl <laughs> when people love it because I, I really do try to put in as much as work in it and so does everyone else that, like, I really don't want to disappoint. And when I see my friends react, like, I remember one of my friends in particular when I was, like, showing them Kaboomberg, they were in the call and they were like, this is real <laughs> because of the leak. And, and I remember just dying on the inside, waiting for them to see it so badly. And uh, <laughs> and it just made me feel so good. It, it made me feel like so great seeing all these streams, all these content creators. And most importantly, like just any player experiencing it for themselves. 
like and hopefully enjoying it because trust me we put in so much work like so much love and passion into this like and i hope you'll enjoy it <laughs> that is all from me <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo what everyone else has said. I know it's it's the cliche, but like, honestly, my favorite memory is just seeing seeing launch day and seeing it all of the years of work that our team had poured into it and the, the community getting invested and the, the, the build up with the story, seeing that all culminate in this amazing day that it was actually out there for people to play and People telling us how much they loved it, how much they were having fun with their friends, coming back to Toontown, um, seeing stuff like this concept transform into the incredible design that we ended on. Like, it's just it, it's pure joy put into this creativity and turned into an experience like a world for all of you to enjoy and for all of us to enjoy. Uh and, you know, it, it's it's game development in a nutshell, but it's like just such a special experience that I never really get over even after, you know, doing this for for almost 10 years now and, and doing it professionally and for shell games like it, it never gets old seeing people react to something that you created and to see it take on a new life because there's there's strategies that you guys have come up with as a community that we didn't even account for. We didn't even think of when we were developing the expansion. We tried our best, but like, it's really cool to see uh, all of the new ways that people take something you created and kind of put their own creativity into it and the way that they play it and the way they role play or come up with strategies or chat with friends. Um, that's that's the reason we do what we do here at Toontown. So, uh, you know, thank you all for the amount of uh, love and support that you've given us over this update. It has been an amazing year and uh, we are so glad that it continues to hold up and create new fun memories for everyone. Uh, so unfortunately, you know, that does bring us to the end of our show for today. Uh, we've been at it for about two hours now, so we don't want to bore you guys by <laughs> continuing on. There's a whole lot more we could talk about. There's still so much that we didn't even get a chance to dive into and so many more development screenshots and and whatnot that we could show but we'll save that for a future time maybe a future tune fest or something of the sort or a future tune cast um but thank you all for being here thank you so much for uh everything that you have done to support the tune town rewritten team we are continuing on to create content like this for you there is stuff uh currently going on right now we're making all sorts of new uh screenshots and fun things that we'll be able to share at a, a stream like this one in the future. But uh, in the meantime, just stay tuned for next year. Next year we have, uh, we're celebrating the big 20th anniversary of Toontown Online, as well as, which is happening in June. And then the 10th anniversary of Toontown Rewritten happening in September. So 2023 is going to be a really big year for, for Toontown as a whole. And we are so excited to celebrate with you guys. But until then, we hope that you guys have uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, all that good stuff, and uh, a happy new year. And we will see you again next year to talk about some more uh, fun new content. Wait, wait. Um, I yeah. just wanted to mention that we have a social media post going on about a new trading card that we are working on. So if you have any ideas for either a prop or a gag that you would like to see in a trading card, make sure you go there. Check out the social media. I think it's on Twitter and maybe a few other things. And send us ideas there. And one of them will be picked. Yeah, definitely. And um, a good note, too, that like not just with the trading cards, but like you guys help shape the future of Toontown. So you can also always stop by our Discord server at toon.town slash Discord or send us an email with any feedback about ideas or things that you want to see added or changed in the game. Um, we're always looking at that stuff. But definitely check out the trading card one because you guys will be able to help us choose uh, one of the new trading cards, the, the physical trading cards that we release for Toontown Rewritten through member mailers. That'll be available next year. But uh, yeah, that's all that we've got. So thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Good night. Bye. Have a great night, everyone. Good night. Good night, Good friends. Night.